we're now into OpenMP and taking our CO2 and multi-threading it. We just kind of did a demo, moving it from single-threaded, and we were at nine seconds. And multi-threaded, we were still in the 30-second range, 100-second range, stuff like that. We also saw that once we started profiling the multi-threaded application, we started getting system time from the profiling, had to slow down the interval or the sample rate so that we don't over-aggressively sample the program. And we were playing with PS run experiments to look at both subroutine names, perfects, 32 counters, and then profiling on an individual counter to get a line number in the program where we're taking TLB misses, cash misses, things of that sort. And it's an iterative process. Again, take care of your first single CPU issues first, the stride patterns, the TLB misses, the cash misses. So what we need to do today is get OpenMP and MPT going. We want to identify an OpenMP application. And what I did in the demo earlier is I did a dash parallel to compile this application. The rule in this class is we can't change source code, kind of like a benchmark situation. And uh, also, the GNU compiler does not have dash parallel, so I needed the Intel Fortran compiler to get that Cook Associates CAP preprocessor that dash parallel invokes that will take your code, go find the do loops, and then put uh, OpenMP directives around the do loops. And then we were using PS Run. There are two things I'm trying to identify in OpenMP, barrier synchronization and false cache sharing. And that's where we left off in the uh, prior demo was looking at those two. I also want to talk about the environment variables that affect OpenMP. And then I was using top and PS-T to see the per thread information. When you're in top and you see percent CPU greater than 100%, other than the first time you start, the very first sample when you bring up top is not going to be a consistent sample. It doesn't have a consistent interval. You need to get a second or third interval before you have a confidence interval and, and stable sampling rate. So if it's more than 100%, I generally look for p-threads and use the capital H in top to find them. So the key thing when I'm multi-threading now is to look for barrier synchronization. We were just looking at the Intel barrier synchronization, which was a yield synchronization event. And there was one point there where I was thrashing crazy on context switches because I set the number of threads greater than the number of CPUs. And then where we left off in the demo just before break was the false cache sharing. So when we are multi-threading, first of all, in OpenMP, there's an environment variable OMP num threads that specifies how many threads the parallel region is going to spawn off. But an application might have a library routine to actually hard code or set that by itself. Also, the Intel libraries by default used to pick the number of CPUs in the CPU set for the number of threads to spawn, but the Intel compiler I got here is actually using the number of CPUs on the system, and that could be real bad. Say I'm on a 2048 CPU system, and I try to go 16 threads wide and just use one blade or one socket. But now my uh, our libraries are going to spawn off 2048 threads because that's the number of CPUs it sees on the system. And now you're going to be thrashing on a barrier synchronization problem. You have to explicitly set OMP num threads these days. Now, to take that one step further, the OM place command from SGI automatically hard sets the OMP num threads for you. So you don't have to worry about that if you're in a uh, OM place environment. Uh, we'll talk about D place and OM place last thing today and get into it in detail tomorrow. Now, again, I may say I want to go 16 threads wide, and I'd like the thing to be 16 times faster, but that's not possible. There's what's called Amdahl's Law that says the entire program is not parallel. You've got serial portions of the program. So there is going to be some degradation in, in the scaling just due to the uh, serial portions of the program. 
But the real problem now is we were at 9 seconds, and then suddenly I'm at 36 seconds times 32 CPUs, and within the 20-minute range, we were at like uh, 11, 1,200 seconds, which was about 20 minutes of CPU time. When I was single CPU, I was only 9 seconds. So I'm wasting a lot of CPU time on what was called communication overhead, what I've been referring to as barrier synchronization or a stuck barrier. And Intel MPI is doing a SCED yield on a stuck barrier, so we were seeing high system time due to that synchronization attempt. And then the other thing I was trying to find was hot cache lines and find the false cache sharing. So when we left off, I did an experiment that was tracing on the false cache sharing event using that false.xml file to profile on. So both of these things give me poor scalability. Now, interesting to me, code 2, CLINT has barrier problems, but last I looked, XD, read, and state had false cache sharing problems. Both of these events, both barrier synchronization and false sharing, are going to get worse as your thread width gets worse. So what you're trying to do is get rid of any of that false sharing or barrier problems. So multi-threading techniques. Uh, I kind of put it at two ends, what I call tightly coupled applications that are latency critical, and then loosely coupled applications that are not latency critical. Now, in a open MP environment, this is only single single system aware. It does, OpenMP does not go across a cluster. There is a cluster OpenMP, but we don't endorse it. It does not perform very well. Uh, OpenMP is simply compiler directives to take a do loop and spread it across the CPUs. As a programmer, I don't need to rewrite the algorithm. I just put a compiler directive around it to say, put this across the CPUs and let the compiler do the work. Even easier is what I'm using, auto-tasking, and I do a dash parallel and say, you figure out which do loops to make parallel. Now, to me, these are typically latency critical, tightly coupled applications. They're on the same CPU, and if you're communication overhead sensitive, you're going to be latency critical. So this is, again, what are the sizes of the array? If I take a large array and break it up into lots of little chunks, I can get through that little chunk quicker and have to do my barrier sync in a higher intensity. So if I take a terabyte array and break it up into 10 chunks and have uh, 100 gig chunks, it's going to take a long time to go through that 100 gig chunk and therefore, my communication overhead is going to be less. And therefore, my latency is not going to be as critical. But now if I start going more threads wide, and I've chunked the data now instead of 10 chunks, maybe 1,000 chunks because I'm on a 1024 CPU system, now I've got smaller chunks to process. It's going to get through that chunk quicker and therefore have to have a higher intensity of communication barrier synchronization and become latency critical. Same thing with MPI. Now, MPI, you have to rewrite your application, and everything about MPI is to break up the data. The chunks are now called the message. So when I decompose, chunk, break up the array, the size of the messages that MPI is using between the hosts is relevant. So again, if I'm breaking up my messages into two megabyte chunks, there's going to be more work to process that two megabyte chunk and lower intensity of barrier synchronization attempts. If I break that message down into a 32K byte chunk or something, I'm going to get through that message chunk processing quicker have higher intensity for my uh, communication overhead, for my synchronization attempts, and therefore become latency critical again. So the same application could go from a bandwidth critical to a latency critical depending upon how it breaks up the data, decomposes it, and spreads it across the CPUs. 
Now, OpenMP is on the same machine, and those are spawned by pthreads, and pthreads share the address space between each other. That makes OpenMP more sensitive to false cache sharing. And by the way, I could take an application, go 32 threads wide, they're all on their own CPU, and they're going to be stepping on the same cache line, causing false cache sharing problems, causing directory memory to get hot and CC NUMA and the intervention invalidations to get hot on the interconnect. Uh, so OpenMP is going to be more sensitive to false cache sharing. MPI is spawning the threads actually as a fork, as a process. So with OpenMP, I had to do the dash capital T or the dash capital H in top to see the threads. But with MPI, they are not threads. They're not using the pthread library. They're using the fork system call. So a normal top or PS will show each rank, if you want to call it that, of the MPI application. Now, when a programmer is writing MPI, they are breaking up the data into message size chunks. And the assumption is, is that message is going to get sent across a interconnect like a network interface or infinite band or something like that to a separate host that is not in the same cache coherent domain. So MPI, with the assumption that these messages are going to be on different hosts, do not have as much false cache sharing issues. Again, if they're on two separate hosts or two separate partitions, there's not going to be a coherency requirement between them. Now, a lot of vendors started off with OpenMP because that was uh, what was available at the time. And when I take an application, it's easy for me to stick directives around a do loop without changing the whole application. Once I got into MPI, which was kind of the uh, the follow-on to OpenMP or multitasking, uh, with MPI, I had to rewrite the application, which made it longer to rewrite the whole algorithm and also longer to validate the results and stuff. So a lot of vendors would start with an OpenMP solver and then go to an MPI solver. So there are cases where OpenMP might be better for you and other cases where MPI might be better. In the weather market, they'll often do both. They'll use MPI to spawn across the hosts within the cluster. For example, if I had 100 racks of UV equipment, I might partition that into like 25 hosts and then use MPI to spawn the work onto each host. And then on the host, use OpenMP to spawn the threads on each host. So that's a hybrid application. Now, I did have one customer that had a problem. They ran MPI and then spawned OpenMP. They run a 64 CPU system, so they said spawn 64 MPI ranks. But they'd linked in an OpenMP SCSL library at the time. So each of those 64 ranks then spawned off 64 threads per rank. Hang on a second. Um, I'm all fine. 64 times 64. I've got 4096. So that scenario, I was a 64 CPU system, but the application was spawning 4096 threads, and that oversubscribed the machine and caused the barrier synchronization problems and the false cache sharing problems. So using OpenMP and MPI together, you do have to be careful. Again, you want one thread, one worker tied down to a CPU, always on the same CPU with D-Place, and nobody else on that CPU. You'd even like to keep interrupts and check config demons away from that CPU. Now, there is another multi-threading library called Shemem. This goes back to Cray's. Cray XMPs, for example, multi, first multi-CPU system, but they were not a virtual memory machine like PDP-11s that Unix started on. Uh, Cray XMPs and initial Cray's in that era had a 
address range that would cause a segmentation fault if you tried to address outside your real memory. So original Cray Unix called Unicos did not have the inner process communication interface that standard Unix had. They had no way of implementing that with that type of hardware. So SGI, I'm sorry, Cray created a Shemem library. This was primarily being used again by the weather market. So Shemem was an interface to replace the standard IPC stuff. And then when SGI bought Cray, Shemem was implemented into IRIX and then it was pushed into Linux for portability. Okay, so Shemem is out there. There were a couple other libraries available at the time. There was a Arena library and there was a PVM interface. Those have kind of been dropped because they weren't being used often enough. So we used to call this thing the message passing toolkit because it had a whole bunch of things in it. But now it really just has MPI and Shemem. And again, with MPI, I could start it off on my single CPU laptop, write and decode my application, and then go to the largest cluster I can find in the world and combine everything. The other thing that we have are pthreads. This is the POSIX standard to create what we call a lightweight process. Orcs take a long time. There is locks on the process table and stuff like that. Pthreads call clone. Clone is different than a fork. Clone creates shared address space. So pthreads calls the clone system call, and every thread that is forked with clone is sharing the address space with the parent, whereas a fork does not. There are applications out there that might call clone directly. Some of this goes back to IRIX, and there was a NSPROC. If you've got IRIX background, NSPROC was the IRIX system call to create a lightweight thread. New SPROC, shared process to, to create a clone. And clone is now the standardized interface to do that. Now, we had applications in IRIX that got ported into Linux that were still using clone instead of using a pthread interface. Specifically, I'm thinking of Ansys and Abacus. So there are a couple of SGI versions of those applications that call clone directly, which means they don't have a library interface in between where environment variables could get picked up on. Now, the person that maintained those applications left SGI a couple years ago, and I don't know how many people actually have apps they're calling clone directly anymore. What they're trying to do is get rid of extra layers in the application. Anyways, tightly coupled to me means that we are communication sensitive. Loosely coupled says, I am not latency critical. These are usually things that are independent of each other. For example, in my mind, I might have some sort of a real-time environment that might be latency critical but has different worker threads to it. So we might have a couple of threads that are dealing with the video stream coming down. We might have a couple of threads that are post-processing the video stream. We might have a couple of threads that are then looking for uh, movement of objects in that video stream to track it and get triangulation on it. And each of these subsystems might be tightly coupled be within themselves, but loosely coupled between each other. We might have uh, three or four different independent worker groups that have different responsibilities. They're tightly coupled within themselves, but loosely coupled between each other. So standard Unix has had this IPC stuff from the beginning, messages, semaphores, and shemem. Other multi-threading techniques, there was a Linda compiler out there. I know that Gaussian was using that a long time ago. There was a PVM interface. MPI kind of took over from PVM. PVM was driven by a customer, Arnold Air Force Base down in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee area, 
and MPI was driven by the university and academia and vendors. So MPI kind of got more favor to it. So moving on, OpenMP is a compiler directive. It is a standard out there. It's clues to the compiler, but we let the compiler do the work. This gives me incremental changes. I only have to stick suggestions around do loops. It gives me faster experiment cycles, easy to get moderate gain, easy to validate results because the algorithm is the, chain, is the same. But it is not cluster aware. There is a cluster OMP from Intel. We do not endorse it. Again, OpenMP can scale poorly because of false cache sharing and threads sharing the same address space. And people may solve the easy problem thinking they're done. So I could have an application out there. They made it OpenMP, but they don't know if they're actually spending more time in communication than computation. They need to profile to do that. Dash parallel was the easiest way to get your worst performance. I like to say it will parallelize your application, not parallelize it. Again, each thread is a separate uh, thread in the PS-T space. Let me come back to that. So I just took a simple example here of a subroutine that's going to do a do loop. And all we've done here is put a compiler directive in front of it saying that the array A is going to be shared between the threads and I is going to be private with each of the threads that are spawned. And then the parallel region ends right here, and that is my barrier point. I cannot fall out of this parallel region until all the threads have finished their work. That's my barrier synchronization point right there. Now, this is not an application programming class. On that DVD, I did give you the uh, HPC optimization tuning programming class that gets into OpenMP in more detail. All I'm interested in is profiling and being able to spot inefficient, non-productive resource consumption, like we saw during the demo of a barrier synchronization problem with the sked yield, the system time, context switches going crazy, and then the other one was false sharing. Now, I am not going to stick OpenMP compiler directives in the source. The rule in this class as an administrator or a benchmarker is I cannot change my source code. So all I am doing is a dash parallel. This will invoke the Cook Associates preprocessor, which, by the way, was the major vendor uh, we worked with in Cray days to get multi-threading stuff going as well. Now, Dash Parallel has some options to specify how aggressively I want to try to stick OpenMP compiler directives into the code. And some of the things that you want to do is avoid calls within a loop what's called a loop carry dependency. If I've got a do loop with a, a go-to type of thing or subroutine jump or call within that do loop, that's going to not let – that will avoid or break the parallelization, possibly even the vectorization of that loop. One of the things the compiler might do is put a subroutine in line within that function so you don't actually have a jump out of the loop. Keep in mind also that jumps out of that do loop will impact the instruction pipe, cause, potentially causing instruction pipeline flushes and branch mispredicts as, as I have to keep jumping out of that loop. Now, I haven't played with this much, but parallel threshold says how aggressively do I want to handle this preprocessor? The chances for auto parallelization. A zero versus 100, a zero says paralyze everything, which is the most aggressive. A zero is your most aggressive. And then 75 is your default, and then 100 says only parallelize the loops that are really, really profitable. So we're just playing with 75 by default. Now, PS and top, when you're an open MP, is only a total for all threads visible you have to use the dash H. And this is very, very important. We have a second thread that is a shepherd. 
I was showing you that before. We need to skip that thing when we're placing things. You'll often see a D place dash X2. Now that X2 is a skip pattern in hex. So if I had a two, that would be a zero zero one zero type of hex pattern. And that would say skip the second thread in placement. I might also, for example, in real old Intel nine compilers and stuff, there was a there were actually two threads that were shepherds and you'd do a dash X fix. And then that would be a skip pattern of a uh, zero one one zero. So that six into hex would be zero one one zero, which would say skip the second and the third thread. This is what's hard for me. I go out to a site, they spawned off ten twenty four threads, but I don't know what they spawned off before they spawned off those threads. I don't know what other things they forked off before that. They might have had a system library call in there that went off and did an LS or something like that. So I need to know the spawning order. I need to know the spawning characteristics of the application to see what it spawned to get proper pinning. So I do not want to pin these shepherds. If I ask for 32 CPUs, I'm actually getting 33 threads. And if I pin them, that 33rd thread is going to end up back on the same CPU as the first thread, and now I've got a problem. When I submit to PBS, I don't want to ask for 33 threads, because that shepherd we don't care about. But I've got to skip the pinning of it. So D place or OM place are critical. Now, the load level and SAR Q are counting threads. And again, uh, PS-T only shows threads, but I think there's thread names available there now. We'll have to take a look at this. And there is an entry for totaling all the threads together as well. I'd like to go off and share my desktop here. Let me go to FOI3, only because it's got more CPUs. So we're going to real WL. Again, let's do a topology. So I've got 64 CPUs here. I'm going to do dot slash code to MP except I've got to load the library, so it's complaining. Module load Intel, see if that's there. Module avail. Again, this system did not get fixed yet. I want to fix that right now. The module's passed. And I'm going to comment out this one and add in my own. By the way, one of the reasons that I put it into uh, slash SW instead of slash opt is I like to keep my asynchronous unbundled products on a separate disk, separate partition, so that if I have to reinstall my golden root, I don't have to reinstall all my other products. Now, we used to use slash op, but the problem nowadays is that the OS is putting things into slash op. And if I were to have a slash opt with different rev levels of things, this slash opt would then have to get synchronized to the other slash opt every time I do an install. Because the install would install on the root slash op, but my slash op would be on a separate disk. So we're avoiding trying to synchronize this stuff off and putting everything into slash SW instead of slash opt. I've seen sites use slash software, but we really don't want to use slash opt anymore because there's other things. Again, these got are tightly coupled, integrated products that come with the distribution. <clears throat> 
anyway. So I should have a module avail now. Do a module load. Oh, I did not get uh, Intel in the system yet. So let me check on this. I've installed it this morning. And rather than actually getting the module file working right now, I'm just going to source. And let me just source uh, this one right here, see what this gives me. It wants the architecture type. Let me uh, let me do a set rep library. That's the path I got. Let's just check to see if it's there. And we do have the uh, lib I O M P in there. Any questions right now? So I could go back and fix that uh, or create a module file. I'm just trying to save time right now. No questions? So I'm going to fire off this code to MP, do a PS. I only see one entry there. Okay. I'm going to do a PS dash uh, T. Now I see each individual entry. Let's try a TM, and now I get it without the thread name. And again, notice my second thread here, the shepherd, is not doing any work. So here's the total for all the threads, and then here's each individual thread. Oh, let's see, PS. I'm going to go into slash proc slash 3248 or 32533. And in there, I'm going to go into the task directory, and here are the thread IDs for each of the threads that were spawned. So this here is coming out of this directory, whereas that top one, which was the total, like this one right here, is coming out of the directory above it, in particular coming out of this file here. Application is done. There's nothing in that directory anymore. Okay. Do that again. And if I go into top, I'm seeing uh, more than 100% here. It's a 64 CPU system, so I'm seeing about you know, 99% times 64 CPUs. By the way, I do see a find. I do see some code fives running here. How big is my cache? I got 160 gig cache. I've got uh, 21 gig free on the machine. I want to check something here. Cache slash proc slash mem info. So my slab is rather big right now at 143 gig. Not so good. Uh, oh, I'm not root. And I have coded this machine in chain slab ratio to allow me to get a bigger slab. Let me do a slab top dash s oops slab top dash s space c while we're waiting there's my slab it's all xfs directories there's a buffer head in here as well. Let me go back what we had here. Buffer is not bad. 350 meg. Uh, no dirty, no write back. I'm hoping to get time. One of you had a question about uh, BF and DU being different. I hope to get time to do that. 
but let's see here. Shamem is also real small. So if, remember, if I look at my cash field here, cash, what do we got? Hang on. Let's get out of there. The cash field was 17 gigs. And when I bring up top, I have 157 gigs. So remember, it added slab into that. So we know that it is all slab, and in fact, I can see metadata activity here. Let me do an I here. There's all those code fives, and here's a find. A little bit of I await time. Let me do an F and a why here for example is one that is waiting on IO and remember we've learned how to track XVM dash so let me go into CD slash sys slash block XVM dash zero then there's a vol dash info directory if I cat the thing there I can see that this is the scratch file system that we're talking about. XVM show dash T dash E um, file slash backslash asterisk. And then I can see that scratch file system are these devices here. And anyway, we can trace that back. Uh, where was I? Let's just move back to the workbook. I was trying to show the top big H and show you the PS dash capital T. And then also with going into slash proc. By the way, if I go into slash proc slash dollar dollar, that's my current shell. If I do more on stat, the stat file, there's the PID, there's the process name, there's the state. I want to do something here. Uh, if you're interested, I don't know if you have a hard copy here or not. I want to go to the uh, application memory module. Module 13. Yeah, there it is there. You look at page 1337 of the workbook. In the notes underneath, it goes through and describes each of the fields. That stat file is written by this proc array.c subroutine. And in there, you can see what each of the fields are, the PID, the command name, the state. So I have documented each of the fields that are in that stat field. Let me just get out of there. So uh, echo dollar dollar, my login shell basically, 32715, which is the directory I'm in. But if I go in the task directory, I still have an entry just for that one thread. So if I did a PS dash big T, I'm not even seeing it there, big T little m, now I can actually see kind of the uh, shared process ID. Now they use different terms for this. Sometimes it's a lightweight process, lightweight thread, things of that sort. Uh, let's see, let's see what just a little m does. The little m is not giving me the uh, thread ID here. That's basically the thread ID. Unfortunately, PS does not work on a thread ID, only a process ID. Let me prove that here for a second. 
go in there. I'm going to go in the task directory. So here's all my tasks. Now, PS, so I can do a uh, PS-P on this 32808 and get something. But if I do it on one of the other ones, like 32809, it doesn't know how to find the thread ID. There's no T option or anything like that. I really wish that it would, but it doesn't. Let me try a PS-P on the 08-T. And then you can see each of the individual threads for that particular process. But I can't get it one at a time. I wish I could. I'll explain that later. Any questions right now? Let me go back to the workbook. So I was trying to show you a little bit. We're going to come back to that extra shepherd there when we get into D-Place. And context switches and load levels and SAR-Q will all be reflective of a high thread count. And then I was showing PS options, too. So getting into multi-threading, the first thing is data locality, dealing with false cache sharing. This is with threads mod modifying write variables to a cache line that is shared with other variables and shared with other CPUs. Again, I like to compare false cache sharing to being like a marathon run. The gun goes off. Everybody is tightly packed. They're stepping on each other's toes. They've been packed in too tight, and you can't run very fast. Once they kind of spread out and there's some padding between the runners, then they can start letting loose with their run. Uh, we'll come back to that. Partitioning or decomposing or chunking my array. How do I break up the array? There's one called load balancing, one called static, where you just say break it up into 64 chunks. There's one called dynamic. There's one called guided. I'm not going to spend any time in that area. That's an application tuning or application programmer issue. The other one is thread scheduling. How many threads do I spawn? There's static or there's dynamic. With static, I will spawn a given number of threads throughout the entire program. So if I set OMP num threads to 64, every parallel region is going to have 64. Dynamic is going to look at the load level before each parallel region. So if I had five parallel regions, it's going to check the load level as it enters each do loop. Based upon that load level, it will figure out how many processes to spawn, how many threads to spawn. The trouble is it is committed to that thread count throughout the entire do loop. So if I have a lot of short bursty do loops, I'm okay because my load level isn't going to change much in a couple of seconds. But if I have a do loop that takes an hour for that do loop to run, and I do a, a load level check at the beginning of the loop and it's low, but then while it's running for the hour in that parallel region for that individual do loop, the load level changes. We're committed to that thread width throughout the whole time, throughout that parallel region. Then we fall out of the do loop, go to the next do loop, and then it will, in that parallel region, check the load level again and determine how many threads to spawn. I myself don't know if anybody actually doing dynamic. Generally, we're doing static. The next thing, and this is what we've been seeing the most, is barrier synchronization, communication overhead. Now, there is an old term here going back into the uh, 90s and stuff like that called gang scheduling. With gang scheduling, the concept is that all the threads are connected. They are on a party line. They're not playing phone tag. They're on a party line and able to talk to each other. We don't really have gang scheduling. There is no guarantee that all these threads are going to be connected at the same time. That's one of the reasons we turn off the CPU scheduler by using D-Place and give everything affinity to the same CPU and make sure it's always connected and running. So we've got to talk about spins versus yields. What we've been seeing so far have been yield barriers, and that is the Futex system call and that KMP weight and the SCED yields going on. I want to switch to a spin later. <clears throat> 
So there's some lab experiments to deal with false cash sharing. I have a Pi program out there called Pi Good and Pi Bad. to demonstrate that. And then I'm just using the uh, code 2MP for the communication stuff. Now the last thing we need to deal with, and this is going to fall into tomorrow, is data and thread placement. So tomorrow morning I want to wrap up with a PBS CPU set environment using dplace and lock everything down. So we have a couple of environment variables available to us. The, uh, there is a manual, there is an OpenMP manual from Intel that's kind of marked as a Cook Associates manual that talks about these. But OMP schedule determines how do I chunk or break up my data. What we're going to play with is OMP num thread, which is a static. We're going to specify the number of threads, which I want to be uh, the number of CPUs that I am using in my CPU set. And we're not going to play with dynamic much. The one that I do want you to play with is how do we talk to each other. Now the Intel library has a KMP underscore library environment variable, which I was told was going to become an OMP idle policy, but I don't know where that is yet, what happened to that. So think about this. And by the way, if you're taking the certification test for this class, there's a question on this. So you got to think about terminology here. A turnaround, KMP library is set to turn around or throughput or serial. Remember I mentioned found an application, open MP, NPI, high thread, hybrid. They spawn 64 threads on a, or spawn 64 ranks on a 64 CPU system, and then each of those had linked in an OpenMP version of scientific libraries, which then spawned off 64 threads, giving me uh, too many threads for that CPU for that system, 4096 threads, overcommitting it. So what we did was set their KMP library to serial so that they turned off the OpenMP interface which also got rid of false cache sharing and all the system time associated with the SCED yield from the barrier synchronization. So serial flips an OMP back to single threaded without recompiling anything. Now the other two, think about your mindset. Who cares about throughput and who cares about turnaround? Throughput is a metric for jobs per second or jobs per hour, jobs per day. Throughput is a metric that a data center manager cares about. So if you think about throughput, the concept of throughput is implying that I am sharing the system and I've got multiple jobs running. So in that scenario, a throughput situation, which is the default, we are automatically going to do SCED yield. Now that is better if I am oversubscribed because I can yield to somebody. I can, when I do the sched yield, it has somebody to give it to. So in a job mix situation, multiple jobs running, when I am in throughput and doing sched yields, I need somebody to sched yield it to. But right now, I have not been get, having anybody to sched yield it to. So I do the sched yield, it comes back to me, and I am thrashing on sched yield. So because I don't have anybody to give it to, I'm getting high system time. Turnaround is what the end user cares about. Me, I don't care about jobs per day. I just want my job turnaround quick. So in a turnaround situation, the implication is, is that I am undersubscribed. In other words, it is not a job mix. I have nobody else to share the CPUs with. So then you are in a spin situation. And that's better if I'm undersubscribed because I'm not going to spin on a barrier. But if I am oversubscribed, then I'm going to stick my barrier on higher user time. So in both cases, you can get stuck on a barrier. But one will show up as system time, one will show up as user time. Now, there are two other things going on here. 
there is another Cook Associate environment variable, block time, that says, how long do I spin before I do the yield? So if I increase block time, my SCED yield intensity would go down, and now I would spend more time in spins than in yields. That doesn't mean I'm going to synchronize better. That just means I'm not going to thrash on SCED yield. What I wish the Linux community would have done, which SGI did in IRIX, was they had a uh, SGI NAP system call whose purpose was to do a SCED yield, but a NAP argument was passed to it. So this argument says spin in user space until they do the SCED yield. On IRIX, we had a SGI NAP with an argument with it that said, when I sked yield, keep it away from me for a given amount of time. That way, if I do a sked yield, it doesn't throw the scheduler doesn't throw it right back to me because the SGI NAP on IRIX said, uh, yield it away, keep it away from me for a given amount of SGI NAP time. So SGI or the Linux sked yield has no arguments to it. I'm doing SCED yields, and the kernel's giving it right back to me, and I am thrashing on SCED yields. We were at like 80% system time from those SCED yields. So this will reduce the system time, causing higher uh, user time on the spin. Okay. Now, the man pages and stuff say that the default for block time is about two-tenths of a second. Uh, I see SCED yields at a higher intensity than that. I don't believe that it's a two-second default. Uh, false cache sharing. Again, I was trying to get into the hardware events. and Also, there are hub statistics here. So let me kind of get to demo here. But here I ran my program with a PS run, dash P to follow thread. And here's what we were seeing. Sealant is no longer top of the list. I've got all this uh, KMP library routine stuff, and I might even have high system time from it. So that is what barrier synchronization or communication overhead looks like. I want CLint, my worker, to be at the top of the list, not this other stuff. So barriers. What sticks barriers? Two things, thrashing and contention. So a thrashing is non-productive resource use, like thrashing on swaps, thrashing on cash, thrashing on TOBs. Thrashing is going to cause extra work for some threads and cause them to straggle or get left behind. They can't keep up with the other threads. So one of the things that can cause a thread to get stuck and not running as efficient as the others is pneumo latency. So if I lose my affinity and get bounced to a different CPU and my array is now on another blade, that's going to slow me down. Think of gang scheduling, acquire. They're all in unison. They're all connected and disconnecting, context switching as a group and stuff. But if I lose affinity and my latency uh, causes my nine-second program to go to 16 seconds or something, I'm not going to be able to synchronize very well. Another thing that can happen is the data could be initialized different than it's post-processed. So I had a case where the application would zero out the array wrong in a single-threaded fashion, and then when it post-processed the array later, the initialization was not parallel aware, it was not node aware, and then my thread ended up going across the interconnect to get to the portion of array that they were looking at. I'd like to do something here. I wish that I could do this on uh, Linux or on uh, our latest systems here. are 
by the way, is still a good manual. This is for origin tuning and optimization, but about 60% of it is still very useful and valid for basic tuning concepts. But I wanted to go to something that's in here. Uh, let's, I think it's this one here. Let's see. I'm looking for something in particular. I guess it wasn't in that one. Let me go back to the beginning. figures. I'm wondering if it's this one here. Oh, Deep Pro, here we are. This is what I wish I had was Deep Pro on Linux. Here we are. So what I'm talking about is when I multi-thread, I want that thread to access memory only on its node. Now this is just proof of concept. So IRIX had a DPRO command, and each one of these X's here was a memory reference. Not the allocation, but the references later. And we've got four threads, and all four threads are addressing the entire memory address range of the process. This one then, they were able to properly pin and place things such that each thread had its own area, and you can kind of see how the different threads are interleaving across things. Now there's still going to be a, a common area that everything is going to for uh, global variables and stuff like that. But this is showing a good example where the initialization and the post-processing are node aware, and each thread is basically addressing memory on its own node, and we don't have every thread addressing every node. This is reducing interconnect traffic and giving me latency. Anyway, I'd like to be able to get that sort of experiment in the future be able to run an application and see what the references are like. I don't know if you have any questions on this right now. You can send me email or come back to it later. That was the origin optimization tuning guide, and that was an example where the post-processing of the array was different than how it was initialized. Another thing, and this is going on right now, the latest Slash 11 SP2 kernel the trims are not working right. It will go off blade, or off node, I should say, before it started trimming on that node. I want to try to prove that tomorrow. But in actuality, I'm running this newer kernel to test that it does work correctly. So last week I was at a site. They had a bad uh, application that was I.O. intensive. So if the trim failed and the allocation went off node, I attached, by the way, with DLOOK summary. We used this on a Mercedes site out in Europe, found that the uh, pages were all off node from it, and then identified that the trim was actually failing. So when I trim on node, I cannot trim dirty or right back or NFS unstable. That stuff has to flush. So this application was doing right, and then the dirty would go to right back to clean, but then when I tried to allocate memory, I would not trim the clean. Instead, it went off node for the memory. When it ran out of memory within the CPU set, then it started trimming. 
and that is bad, and that's why we've got this test kernel that I'm using. That's got to get fixed, and as soon as we've got that patch implemented, get to that newer kernel. You can send me email if you need the PV on that. Another thing that the trim failed, the thread migration from the CPU scheduler, so I was not pinned to a unique CPU. And also, I could stall on the slab trim. If it takes a long time for the slab to trim, I might start allocating off node again rather than aggressively trying to trim the slab. That's another reason I don't like to see the slab get too big. So each of these things are going to cause a NUMA latency effect, including the bug right now where the trim is not working right. And I'm using DLOOK summary to spot NUMA latency issues. And I would have liked to have had that DPROF type of experiment to show me memory addressing on a per thread basis. Now, another thing that's going to cause latency problems is if my data set chunk is bigger than the node. One of the reasons you might go more and more threads wide is not for the CPU work. I might not be going from 64 to 128 to have 128 CPUs on it. But the issue now might be that breaking the array into 128 chunks instead of 64 chunks, that the portion of the array that a chunk now fits on node, or even better, now fits on socket, on core. So data set chunk bigger than the node, this is where you get, again, into NUMA CTL dash I for an interleave. Remember what I said, latency versus bandwidth. When do I want to tune for latency? When do I want to tune for bandwidth? If my assets fit and can stay local, I want latency. I'm not going to spread them across all the nodes on the system if it fits on the local node. If it doesn't fit, like I'm saying here, then I want to consider interleave. So my original story, which is faster, Ferrari School Bus 747, I said, I don't like the word fast. There's a latency orientation. There's a bandwidth orientation. Once I understood my payload characteristics and said, do my assets fit, then I can make the correct decision about what I want to do. Now, the default is first touch. But if I've got a single-threaded application that is, say, 128 gig in size, and it's not going to be able to hold that data on node, then I'm going to start interleaving or round robbing it. Any questions? So that's one thing that we're constantly looking for is NUMA latency issues. And remember I mentioned PERF and the hardware counters. There is a hardware counter event that says, trap my address every time my latency exceeds a certain threshold. I've never actually used or played with that one. What else will cause thrashing? So this was interconnect thrashing and latency effects. Another one would be memory contention from multiple cores on the same socket or on the same blade. So I've got a site right now that they pin to one socket and leave the other socket open so that the contention on the front side bus or the front contention on the quick pass interconnect is low. One of the problems I'm concerned about as we get more and more cores to a socket, that means more and more contention to the memory on that socket. Also, when I allocate on a node, only one allocation can occur at a time. So now if I'm sitting here in like 24 CPUs on a socket, only one of them can allocate and grow their process at a time. The allocation routines are single-threaded on a per-node basis. I cannot have multiple allocations occurring at the same time. I'm waiting to see, and maybe it's happening, but I'm waiting to see some changes in the kernel that could get a finer grain lock on a per-node basis. So anyway, something that can slow me down is memory bandwidth being saturated from multiple cores on the same socket including the allocation time for multiple cores on the same socket. Another thing, and this is what we're seeing now, SCED yield thrashing when we have more threads than CPUs. Another thing that's going to slow me down and cause barrier problems is false sharing. 
Also, floating point errors. If some of the threads are hitting background of zeros and stuff, they might get floating point errors. Some of the threads might have unaligned mem uh, memory accesses. They're not aligned to a, a cache line boundary, for example. Or another big thing that can slow me down is if I am going across the interconnect to get the data that's on another node, the NUMA link itself could be busy and have high contention from, for example, buffered I.O. If my slab is big, if my dirty is big, all that stuff can drive up my interconnect traffic and cause contention on the interconnect. And that's going to slow me down, too, and make the NUMA latency worse. So this is kind of my checklist for things that cause a thrashing type of event. Any questions on this? The other thing was contention. So for contention, I don't want other things on my core, on my CPU. Improper pinning or multiple threads per core is going to create a severe problem. If I have more worker threads than CPUs, that's going to create a problem. If I have uh, my MPI run too big, that will stick my barrier. If my OMP num threads is too big, that's what we were seeing a little while ago as I was thrashing on SCED yield. If my MPI LinkedIn open MP and you get N NP times NCPUs in the CPU set, I've seen that at sites a lot. Multiple threads on a CPU, that's kind of the same thing as what we've got here. But some of those th threads could be interrupt handlers. Some of the threads could be case swap D. If I don't have any pinning and then the CPU scheduler has placed things or migrated things in a bad way. If I have bad or wrong pinning, one of the things you need to really worry about here is KMP affinity. If, KM, if you're using D-Place, you need to do a uh, KMP underscore affinity equals disabled. And then you can do your D-Place dash X6 uh, code to MP. D-Place and Intel pinning do not work together. I don't know if you're making notes, but if I leave KMP, KMP, KMP Affinity off, I mean, don't don't turn it off. If KMP, KMP Affinity is enabled and I try to use D-Place, they'll be all on the same CPU. That will put them on the same CPU. Fault cache sharing will go away because they're not running concurrently. If I pin all my threads to the same CPU, you won't have false cache sharing anymore because they're all on the same CPU. They can't be modifying a cache line concurrently. So you got to watch for that. And some of this is going to come back to tomorrow morning when we get into D-Place. Also, other workers, shepherds, things like that, things that fork, we need to worry about those. Other contention factors, the operating system noise itself. We use check config, I'm sorry, we use a boot CPU set to create a uh, compartment for all the check config demons so that all that OS noise is just on the zero socket. The flush demon popping up could be noise. K swap D doing trims could be noise. Even interrupts coming in could be noise. So I'm kind of done here. Uh, there's a little piece here about POSIX threads. This POSIX came along kind of after OpenMP and MPI. It's a POSIX compliant library. It uses clone underneath. OpenMP on Intel is using pthreads underneath. pthreads are not cluster aware. You kind of see pthreads more in C programs. Netscape, things like that. I should change that now to Firefox or something. So for a pthread application, I have to include pthread.h, uh, define my variable, my thread as being pthread. Right here is where we create the threads. That's going to end up in a clone. And in this example, each of the threads is going to call the thread routine. And after all spawn, this is my barrier. 
tthread underscore join is going to wait for all the threads to finish, and we're going to sit here spinning. This is my barrier synchronization point. Once all the threads have fallen through, I have synchronized, I can then exit. And all this thing is doing is doing a hello world. So summary, four main multi-threading techniques, OpenMP, Dash Parallel, and then MPI. I'm going to take a break, and then we're going to go back to MPI. And also pthreads. I have to worry about shared memory address space. Virtual sizes get bigger than what is really used because each thread has to be able to address into each other's thread. And then I was looking at environment variables. A uh, whole bunch of uh, the documents and man pages here. Uh, here, for example, is the OpenMP environment variable. That's the OpenMP manual. Uh, let's move on. So in lab, what I wanted you to do was compile and run that code, too, as a multi-threaded. I also have a pi good and pi bad. I want to use the Intel OMP environment variables and the, uh, that should be a KMP, not a KAP. KMP environment variables. I want you to profile the code with perf and ps run and look for the barrier problem. I want you to be able to figure out how many threads you have and count them and spot the, the shepherd. And then I want to be able to identify a barrier problem and identify a false sharing problem. So for this one, we're using code 2MP. And for this one, we've got a pi good and a pi bad. By the way, with those pi goods and pi bads, you have to compile them with a dash O zero. If I compile with a default compiler, the compiler will automatically pad my variables to avoid false sharing. These examples will not work in a default compiler optimization. The compiler fixes it for you. So let's take a break here.